Well, good evening, everyone, and good evening to all of you online. It's glad to have all of you here. <clears throat> the, um, tonight's message is called Father Knows Best. And how many here remember the old TV show Father Knows Best? A few of us? Yeah. You know the one starring Robert Young? Yeah, the guy in the coffee commercials. <laughs> Uh, but before he was advertising for Sanka, he was also Marcus Welby, MD, right? Trivia question there for you. Um, well, I mean, even though it was filmed in the, in the 50s, I still remember watching reruns when, when I was a boy in the 70s, and along with shows like Dennis the Menace, and, which incidentally was the same house that was used in Father Knows Best, and, um, and also Leave it to Beaver. How far we've come from network television. <laughs> But um, I realized that, you know, seeing those nuclear families and the idyllic household, um, not everyone's blessed with having a Christian father like, like I was or my wife was. Some people may not have even known their father. And some people grew up in, a, you know, possibly a single parent home. But no matter what your past is, I just want you to know that God loves you. And I know that for some... Um, who had an absent father or knew of an abusive father, understanding that God is our heavenly father who knows best could become a, you know, a bit of a stumbling block or confusing at best, but you have to realize that in spite of what your perception of a father is, God the Father truly loves you. So what do I mean when I say God the Father knows best? Well, first of all, number one, God knows who you're meant to be. He knows who you're meant to be. You know, I didn't choose my hair color. I didn't choose how much hair I would have. <laughs> uh, I didn't choose my eye color or my skin color. I didn't choose my height. I didn't choose my gender. I didn't choose my parents or what language I would speak or what country I would be born in or even the time in human history that I would be born into this world. But God knew. God chose, and he knew what was best. He knew and he chose my inherent strengths and weaknesses, my likes and dislikes, my um, propensity toward certain things and, and uh, avoidance of certain other things in certain circumstances. Well, why would that be? Is it a coincidence? I don't think so. Because my natural strengths, likes, and desires all complement one another, and there is a plan and purpose for that, just like there is for each and every one of you. As an example, someone who has a strength in administration, they like to be in charge. They, they're adept at telling people what to do and, and resolving conflicts. In contrast, the true would be someone who, who lacks those likes and dislikes and, and gifts. You know, it's no accident that everyone in the world doesn't prefer to be the boss. I mean, where would we be? <laughs> you know, what if everyone chose the same profession just because it made the most money? Well, not only isn't everyone cut out for it, to be successful, that is, not everyone would even want to be. Have you ever wondered why? Why isn't everyone this or everyone that? Why doesn't everyone want to drive the same car or the same color car? You know, we all have certain likes and preferences, and it's not a coincidence. God created you unique from everyone else. He made you special. He gifted you with certain abilities, with a fondness for using them, and with those abilities, a desire to seek opportunities to develop them and to avoid circumstances that would stifle or hinder them. God knows best because he created us a unique and special way. Remind yourself of Psalm 138, 13 through 18. For I formed, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they were more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. 
Isn't that amazing how God knew us before we were even born and he knit us in our mother's womb? We are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, our dog Shadow, um, he's 14 now? (laughs) Yeah, a little over 14. Uh, He doesn't just live to eat. I mean, he doesn't just eat to live. He lives to eat. (laughs) There you go. But fortunately for him, um, he does not determine when or how much he eats because then that's all he would do. Um, He's dependent on us to know how much to give him and and when to feed him. And I think the fact that he's 14 and still healthy, you know, is a testament that we don't let him do whatever he wants. Um, But even though he may beg, beg, beg for, oh, I want this, I want this, I want this, just like, you know, because he doesn't know, you know, we have to say, no, Shadow, it's not for you. It's not for you. Now, he may not like to hear it's not for you, but we know best. Oftentimes, we're like my dog Shadow. We don't like to hear it's not for you. After all, we're no one's pet. We think I'm my own master. I decide what I want, how much I want, and when I want it. Well, for the Christian, that mindset runs contrary to the word of God. Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth, you say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. And of course, that high price is the blood of Christ. That high price is his death on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And we should be reminded as Christ followers that Jesus is Lord, meaning we don't belong to ourselves. God is our master. Not that we're some animal incapable of reasoning right from wrong, but we are dependent in an all-knowing, all-loving Father who knows best. You know, as parents, we similarly teach our young children, it's not for you. No touchy, no touchy. You know, they could hurt themselves, right? They could hurt themselves or hurt others. You know, they just don't know any better. Don't touch the stove. Don't stick anything in the wall outlet. Don't put the cat in the clothes dryer. Just because you saw it on the TV cartoon doesn't mean it's a good idea. You know? <laughs> Isn't it a wonderful thing to have a father who not only knows us, but knows what is best for us. You know, a, the strength that, um, that I, a strength that I have that also uh, pairs with uh, a likeness I have is for artistic things. And when I admire fine art, I recognize that, that it's the artist who gives value to it. I've gone into the, the Detroit Institute of Arts and I've seen things that, you know, I couldn't even begin to recreate. And I see other things that I feel like I could close my eyes and whack paint at it and, you know, do the same thing. And they're both, they both cost millions of dollars. It's not what they look like. It's who created it. The thing that looks like splattered paint and the thing that looks like it was a photograph, they have great value because of the artist, not because of what it is. You may look in the mirror and say, God, what am I? What do I look like? You know, it's not what you look like. It's who created you that gives you value. Now, I'm not, compa- not comparing, you know, Jackson Pollock to Rembrandt, but just saying that it doesn't matter how you look. It matters who created you. So not only does God know you, and not only has he given you infinite value because basically he's your artist. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. But another reason our father knows best is because he knows where we should go. Not only who we should be, but where we should go. You know, when we drive our cars, we drive on roads. Well, hopefully. Um, And that road is our path. It's our path to a particular destination. We see signs that may read, To Metro Airport, follow I-94 West. Well, you're not following an object. You're following that path. Well, in following that path, God has given us a path too. And he's 
you know, in following it, we have signs, we have traffic lights to help guide us and warn us. When we see a red light, we do what? We stop. When we read one way, we make sure we're driving that one way. And when we follow Jesus as our Heavenly Father, He sets us on a path too. It's not a wide road. He says it's a narrow road. And he's placed signs along the way so that when there's a fork in the road, we know which way to go. And we may think from time to time, well, I know a shortcut, and we go off-road. Yeah, how does that work out? (laughs) You see, we can't see what's around the corner. We don't know what hazards lie ahead, but God knows. Say it with me. He knows best. So like forks in the road, we live in a world of decisions. We're bombarded with thousands and thousands of ads a day, an hour, to try to influence our decisions. We literally hold the world's information in the palms of our hands. But yet with access to all that information, oftentimes we find ourselves, I don't know, at a loss or without a clear sense of direction. I mentioned that God knows where we should go, but it begins by acknowledging where we are. See, every destination or every path has a, start, has a starting point and an ending point, a point A and a point B. If I pointed to, say, that, those doors over there, okay? I am here, and I want to go there. I am standing on point A, and I want to go to point B. Let's say God wants me to go to point, from point A to point B. All right, great. This is my starting point. I'm still on point A. I'm going to go to point B. No, point B is that way. But I was still here. I was still on point A. See, it's not just to say that I'm on point A. It also has to do with where you're heading. It's not just where you are. It's what direction you're facing. We may think we're okay because we're on our starting point, but we'll miss our target if we're facing the wrong way. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Going to that middle part of verse 13, it says, Straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize. Every athlete knows to keep their eyes on the finish line. How many tragic losses resulted from the front rudder just glancing, even for just a moment or a second, to some side or another person behind them, and then they're overtaken? because they took their eyes off the finish line. It's why in Scripture it says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And this is where I want to focus. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Key in on the phrase, looking to to Jesus. Because if I'm looking this way and God wants me to go that way, what are my chances of getting there? I'm at point A, but point B is not where I'm facing. I have to face toward Jesus if I'm going to go where Jesus wants me to go. And our hearts are prone to wander. You know, we're, it's not easy for us to stay on that straight and narrow, so to speak. Remember I said God puts us on, on a road and it's a narrow road, um, you know, and sometimes he puts rumble strips. <laughs> so, you know, when we're like, nope, get back over here, okay. Nope, get back over here. You know, he wants to keep us on that path. And it's so important that we keep our eyes focused. There's um, a story in... Uh, January 1914, not long after the sinking of Titanic a couple years earlier, that in the thick fog of the Virginia coast, the steamship Monroe was rammed by the merchant vessel Nantucket and eventually sank. 
41 sailors lost their lives in the frigid winter waters of the Atlantic. The New York Times reports that Captain Johnson, quote, navigated the Monroe with a steering compass that deviated two degrees from the standard magnetic compass. He said the instrument was sufficiently true to run the ship and that it was the custom of masters in the coastwise trade to use such compasses. Get this. His steering compass had never been adjusted in the one year he was master of the Monroe. Our hearts are like a compass. They're intended to point true north. But like the steering compass on the Monroe, how much more does our compass, the compass of our heart, need to be recalibrated? Do you think we could really go a year like the Monroe, like Captain Johnson did, without prayer, without reading our Bible, and expect us to know what Jesus wants and where we should go? Of course not. We shouldn't even go one day without prayer and Bible study. We need to frequently calibrate our compass, our heart, so that we are walking toward Jesus, our true north. So number three, God knows what you should do and how best to do it. Father knows best. He knows who we are. He knows who we should be. He knows where we are. He knows where we should be going. And he knows what you should do and how best to do it. Look at John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Like we learned, God is our master. We're not our own. God knows us. He chose us. He equipped us. And we read right here, he appointed us. And that implies that there's a plan, that there's a purpose, that there is a destination. God doesn't just say, go that way and, okay, God, I'm going this way. I have the foggiest idea why, but you know best. No, there is a destination. And he has equipped us to get there. If we were to go on a hike through the Appalachian Mountains, we would have a backpack full of certain things. It wouldn't be too heavy, otherwise we'd be exhausted, but we would make sure we had everything we needed. And God has given us everything we need in our backpack of life, so to speak. He's given us our likes, our abilities, our dislikes, basically everything that we at Woodland call our shape. The things that help us to do what God has called us to do. Have you ever looked out the window of an airplane and all you saw were clouds? And, I mean, you don't really have a wide view range, but everything looked the same, right? That's why pilots need to depend on their instruments. Because if all they saw was clouds, they might miss their destination. The fact is, for every one degree... I looked this up, I didn't just know this. For every one degree a plane gets off course, it will miss its target landing spot by 92 feet for every mile they fly. And when you think of how many miles, hundreds of miles, that's a long way off, one degree. Similarly, if a ship is traveling a long distance over the sea, it must stay on course the entire time. Just one degree off at the beginning of the journey can end in thousands of miles from the intended destination. And we're like that ship, ironically thinking that we're going the right direction, but not realizing that our compass is off because the scenery is so familiar. I mean, every bit of ocean looks the same. And that's the way it is in life. We get so familiar with our surroundings, with, our, with people, with TV shows, with social media, with movies. It just becomes so familiar that we don't even realize that we're really not going the way God wants us to go. Things that are socially acceptable, things that, well, that's not so bad, or that's, not so, that's familiar, that's common, that's accepted. It's just all the ocean. And we don't realize that we're off. And until we open up God's word, until we are praying, until we find ourselves with God and God needs to give us a course correction, do we realize we, were, we weren't going the right way? I mean, we weren't going way out, but the longer we go, 
the further we are. I'm 56 years old. I've been out at sea a long time. I could go back to when I was 20 years old and wish that I could have made some course corrections. Now, I've since made plenty, and my journey's not done, but as we go through life, we need to make those constant course corrections because the further we go without them, the further we miss God's intended plan and purpose for our lives. So we need small course corrections. When there's no land in sight, when everything looks the same, when we can't see over the horizon, we need to depend upon God our Father who knows best. You know, course corrections can be impactful in other ways of life. Consider a man who goes for a checkup with his doctor and, and his blood work reveals that he's just one point. You think about just one degree off from a compass. His blood work shows that he's one point off from being diabetic. And what does he do? He makes a course correction. He changes his diet. He doesn't eat as much sugar. He exercises. He loses 20 pounds. And because of that course correction, he's able to, he's able to make all the difference and prolong his life and, and not develop uh, diabetes. You know, a buzzword we hear quite a bit today is uh, progressive. You know, progressive politics, progressive health care, progressive education. Not talking about the auto insurance. But, you know, we're familiar with progress. We're familiar with the word regress, egress. Well, where do these words come from? I'm glad you asked. Stay tuned for another word nerd moment. <laughs> progress comes from the Latin prefix pro, meaning forward, and gradi, to walk. So it literally means walk forward. For regress, change pro to the Latin prefix re, and you have walk back or return. The e in egress is shortened from the Latin ex, meaning out. So egress means walk out or exit. When you see an egress, that's an exit. But our culture has attributed the connotation of progress as advancement and improvement. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But the extreme literal sense of the word, at least from the etymolo etymological sense, is that progress is merely walking from point A to point B. It's walking. It's forward. It could be forward this way. It could be forward that way. No matter where you're facing, you're walking forward. This isn't walking forward. This is walking forward. This is walking forward. Now, if God wants me to go this way, and I'm going this way, guess what? I'm walking forward. Is that progress? Literally, yes, I'm walking forward. But is that where God wants me to go? No. Progress is only an advantage when you are walking forward in the direction God wants you to go. Progress is not beneficial when you're walking forward in the way God would not want you to go. So where you're facing has everything to do with it. Think of Eden. This was the garden that God created after he created the world and everything in it. And he created Adam in his likeness and image. He placed him in the garden. He said it's not good that he should be alone. He created Eve. And now Adam and Eve are in paradise. And he says, all this I have given you. And you may eat of all the trees in the garden, but... Don't eat from that tree. In other words, no touchy. Okay? Even from the beginning, there was a no touchy. And I know best, because when you do, you will die. Well, the serpent convinced Eve that she knew best. Did God really say? Well, it looked good. And so she was deceived. She was deceived into thinking that she knew best. And the serpent, the devil, has been doing the same thing, deceiving all of us ever since. Wanting us to think that we know best when truly God the Father knows best. Let's go back to John 15, 16. He says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide or your fruit should it remain remember god chose us if we think we chose god first mm -mm. god was around long before us but the fact that he chose us 
Wow. How do you wrap your head around that? But why did he choose us? Well, it says right here that we should bear fruit and that our fruit should remain. Well, what is that fruit? It's lives. It's precious lives who will live forever. Lives that will live in eternity, one place or another. And Jesus said that he would, that none would perish, but all come to repentance. And how does he plan to accomplish that? Through us. Glad you asked. Because by making us like him, by gifting us with unique skill sets and preferences, that everything that we would call here at, Christ, at Woodland our shape would be used to equip us to accomplish his plan. We have a part to play. It's, it's reaching people with the gospel. It's, it's celebrating God's presence by persuading people to become passionate followers of Christ. We all have a part to play in this grand scheme of things, so to speak. But here's the thing. Because God knows us, because God knows where we are and where we should go, because God knows what we should do and how best to do it, when we understand that and when we are in tune with God and recognize what he wants, we'll not only know what we're supposed to do, but we'll find that, hey, we're good at that. You know, if someone asks you to do something and it's hard work, yeah, but it's got to be done. Or if someone asks you to do something that you really enjoy doing and that you're really good at it, that's a lot easier, isn't it? Well, guess what? The unique part that God has you to play, the unique task, the unique ministry that God has for you, you're uniquely good at it. You're uniquely qualified for it. And you like it. You like it. I will say that you will never be more fulfilled than when you're doing God's will for your life. God's will is never meant to be a drudgery. God's will is a fulfillment of everything he knows about you and everything he created you to be. So ask yourself, what is your part to play? How has God uniquely shaped you? What's your ministry? And before you step out, how long has it been since the compass of your heart has been recalibrated? Because you can progress, but unless you are facing God, you're not going in the right direction. And that's why I think things that are saying progressive nowadays, yeah, it is progressive, but I think it's moving further and further away from where God wanted us to begin. If we went back to Eden when everything was perfect and we were with God, being progressive is walking away from that. Being progressive in God's eyes is walking toward him. So as we move forward, let's make sure we're walking forward toward him, keeping our eyes on him, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have fearfully and wonderfully made us. I thank you, Lord, that even when we're out on, out on the ocean of life, when we can't see what's ahead of us, what's behind the horizon, when everything around us looks the same and familiar and, and right seems wrong and wrong seems right, and we're not even sure if we're going the right way. Lord, help us to recognize that we need you. Just as a pilot is dependent upon their instruments, Lord, we are dependent upon your word, the Bible. We cannot trust ourselves. We cannot live by sight. We need to walk by faith. And Lord, we need to be in your word, be in prayer daily. Father God, we give you control. We, we ask you to step behind the helm of our ship and make those course corrections as necessary. The waves of life toss and turn and it's easy for us to get knocked off course. But Lord, by your Holy Spirit, may you take control. May you ensure 
that we are going the way we should go and that we make it to where we should be. We give our lives to you. We recognize you as our Lord and not only our Savior, but also our Master. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.